So I guess we're scheduled to start. We'll give it a couple of minutes just for people to trickle in if that happens. All right, so let's get going. So uh, welcome to the Lake Working Group meeting of IETF 108, not in Madrid, sadly, but I am Stephen. Militia, you can introduce yourself, I guess. And I'm Militia, glad to have you here. And okay, so we have a relatively short agenda. I don't know how we'll go to time, but we have like an hour and a half or so. Um, you can see the various links. You can see this is the note well, that if you've been at other meetings during the ITF week, you'll have seen it. Um, you need to understand what it says. And here's our agenda. So we have, we're in the middle of point zero. Uh, oh, agenda's gone. Um, then given that the working group have adopted ad hoc, uh, we'll have an introduction to that, which is some of which was repeated previously, but some of which has changed over the last while. So it's it's worth doing as a, as a uh, scene setting thing. There's a few open issues we'd like more. And then there's some discussion of uh, some proofs related to ad hoc and AOB. So does anybody want to bash the agenda right now? Uh, I see no one in the queue. Me neither. OK, there, there should be time for AOB at the end, I suspect, uh, yeah. if need be. Um, otherwise, uh, we can move on to Quran. So if you want to jump in the queue, Quran, and send requests to be sending, there you go. OK, so the so manager will drive the slides. If you just say next slide at the relevant point in time, that would be great. OK, thanks. Yeah. Can you hear me well? Yes, we hear you well. Just say next slide when you want me to flip slide, please. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, so just a background here. We have uh, been adopted. This is the working group draft, uh, which we will adopt it in late June. So this version of the draft is essentially identical to the latest individual submission, uh, just some references updated and and some comments on the test vectors in the appendix so if you've read <clears throat> if you read that the previous version uh, the latest individual submission there is there is not so much new in this um, but then again the, the protocol has been changing uh, last year and we have never given any detailed uh, description in, in lake so so that's why we're having this uh, this presentation next slide please So there, there are a couple of slides for background. Uh, it's really, really small font here. Let's see if, if we can get, get, get read everything in, um, through through the meet echo. Um, so, but there are two two background slides in case you haven't missed the discussion uh, the last uh, half year. Um, so, ad hoc is uh, is intended to be a lake a lightweight authenticated uh, key exchange to match the lake requirements. And uh, in particular, there are some challenging performance uh, benchmarks. 
And there is also the ambition to reuse building blocks used by OSCOR, which is lacking an, an ache. And those building blocks are uh, primarily Seaboard for encoding, COSI for uh, Seaboard en encoded crypto wrapping, and COOP for default transport. Uh, and just a disclaimer here, this presentation does not contain anything on security claims, as there is a separate presentation on that uh, following. Next slide, please. Uh, and just a note on, on applications. Uh, we believe this is generally applicable uh, and useful to IoT settings where you have constrained links. Uh, so you need to communicate between a thing uh, and cloud or thing to thing. Uh, at least partly over over some some technology which has uh, restrictions on on message sizes and uh, amount of bytes. So, and specifically, we know that people are interested in deploying this for the join or a bootstrapping scenario when you have a constrained device uh, joining the network for the first time. And there is a large variation on on these scenarios. So it could be different network conditions with special radio technologies or multi-hop or a uh, number of devices connecting at the same time, which makes these uh, links very busy. Uh, and then there are other uh, features which are specific to a specific deployments, uh, like security applications happening simultaneously with the authentication, like authorization or uh, enrollment of certificate. And then there's also a large variation in the type of credentials you'd like to use. Uh, device uh, certificates or uh, raw public keys. Uh, and sometimes you would like to reference those. So there, um, these type of variations uh, is something we need to cater for in the protocol. Next slide, please. So now uh, this, uh, from, from here on to, to the end, this is focusing on, on the protocol. Um, so let's uh, go into the different message fields. There are three messages and an additional error message. And each, uh, each message is a sequence of Seaboard encoded data. Uh, so using the Seaboard sequences, which is, uh, has now become an RFC. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. So on, on a high level, we see the, this is a different Hel Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So we see the, the ephemeral public keys, uh, GX, GY. Uh, and we see the encrypted blobs here uh, the first is an message two. There is an, an XOR, uh, which is different from from previous version of the protocol, which was an authenticated uh, algorithm. Now it's, it's changed after carefully reading the Sigma uh, uh, Sigma analysis, and then we have uh, an AAD in the in the third message. So we'll come later to the encryption keys and and the identifiers. But just for now, now we note that there is this. Uh, signature or MAC structure, which is either a MAC then sign or a MAC. And that depends on the authentication method. So and that brings us to the next slide. So ad hoc specifies four authentication methods uh, targeting uh, the, the variety of IT use cases mentioned before. So for example, the initiator or responder could both have signature public keys to authenticate with, or they could have static to Hellman keys, uh, or it could be a mix. And uh, yeah, I mean, this, the setting here is, uh, I mean, this is what we think is is needed by the scenarios. This is something we could could reevaluate, but but uh, as it seems, we we still need to have because of the uh, ecosystem around PKI for authentication uh, and the tools available. We we do need to have signature, uh, be able to have signatures. Uh, that's also, uh, uh, so the, the reason why we're using, look, looking at things like uh, IDEV ID and this IEEE 802.1R, 1AR is, is requiring uh, signatures. And there's also the um, device certificate enrollment setting where you want to combine that with ad hoc, which, uh, which uh, requires the use of signature for authentication. But on the other hand, if you're using uh, raw public keys, uh, then you, you don't necessarily need to use signature, 
public keys, but you could you get much lower overhead with pub, raw public with the static Diffie Helma. And there is a mix of of raw public keys and certificates, which leads to this mix of of credentials. So next slide, please. So these uh, four uh, methods are then the, the choice of method is then signaled with the first element in the first message. Uh, so the initiator selects and the responder um, can then either accept or, or reject and, and, and uh, stop the protocol. In this first element, we also have a field on, on correlation, uh, which is the uh, an encoding of what, what uh, correlation is provided by the underlying transport. And that's useful, uh, for example, for, for the connection identifiers. And so there are explicit connection identifiers for the initiator and responder. And those may be omitted if, uh, if the underlying transport already provides that information. So for example, with core equals one, there is a correlation. Uh, it's indicating there's a correlation between message one and message two. Uh, for example, in the case that the initiator is a co-op client, and the responder is a co-op server, then the co-op protocol provides the token, which already has this information about correlation. So the connection identifier in the second message can be uh, the CI in the second message can be can be omitted. Next slide, please. Um, so this brings us to the cipher suites. Um, the cipher suites is an a, a cipher suite is an ordered set of cozy code points both um, COSI algorithms for ad hoc and also for the application, in this case, OSCORE. So it's a seven tuple. Uh, the five first are, are the algorithms for ad hoc, uh, and uh, the two last are for, for the application. And this seven tuple is then identified by an integer. And, and here are the four cipher suites which are defined in the draft. Next slide, please. Um, so each, each suite is an integer, and the uh, protocol field suites i is an ordered set of suites, uh, starting with uh, the selected suite and following uh, the supported suites, which are the cipher suites which the initiator supports in order of preference. And this uh, supported uh, suites that can be truncated at the end. Uh, and if the truncation uh, of the supported suites is only only leaves one suite co coinciding with the selected suite, then you can just use that suite as the element of suite i. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here here is uh, an example of how how cipher suite negotiation works, and it's using the error message. So the error message uh, in general has uh, potentially three fields. It's an optional connection identifier. It's an error message, which is the text string. And it's optionally the suites R uh, containing the cipher suites in suites I supported by the responder. And if it's only one, uh, then you could have just that int. So uh, here's an example of using uh, the, uh, the error message. Uh, suites R can only appear in responses to message one. And this is the case here. We have message one containing um, it's an initiator supporting cipher suites five, six, and seven. Uh, and selects uh, suite number five. Responder, however, does not support suite number five, but suite number six. So it responds uh, with suite R equals six. And then uh, a new session is shown here where the initiator is selecting suite number six and includes uh, a truncated list of supported cipher suites. Next slide, please. Um, so now we come to the credentials and identifiers. And as we've seen, we need to support a variety of, of credentials. And the ID cred uh, for initiator and responder are used to enable the retrieval of the credential. Uh, the ID cred uh, is encoded as a COSI header map, which means it's a Seymour map, 
and it's using specific cosy header parameters uh, from, from a certain IANA register. And out of this register, you could see, you could, for example, you could use RPK can be identified uh, with a KID header. Uh, and certificates, which KID is essentially a key identifier. Uh, and a certific certificate, X509 certificate, can be identified using the X5T header, which is a, a hash of the certificate, or X5U, which is the URI. Now, the actual credentials, cred I and cred R, uh, they are covered by, by the signature of MAC here. So that's what, what's being integrity protected. Next slide. Yes, so that brings us to, so that these identifiers are encrypted as well as signature MAC, and that brings us to the, to the key hierarchy and this is really small font now um, but fortunately there are colors here um, this this picture is inspired from the from the tamarin formal verification paper um, uh, uh, there's a question in the in the chat here what does rpk mean that means raw public key uh, but apparently he left the room maybe he got the message before leaving um, so so this key, um, as I said, this, this picture was taken from, from uh, a simpler version was taken from the formal verification paper. Thank you very much for that. And I tried to fill in the details. Uh, so let's use the colors. Um, so in red, we see the Diffie-Hellman shared secrets. At the top is the ephemeral ephemeral shared secret. And on the left, uh, it's the um, ephemeral static uh, shared secrets. And this is their input and the output here on the right hand side in blue are the encryption and MAC keys. So a little bit more careful look, we see that at the top is the ephemeral ephemeral key, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, and uh, to the left we have the ephemeral static keys, which are used together with HTADF extract, the green box, uh, to get the pseudo random keys, which are the orange boxes. Uh, and there's a dependency of method here. I'll get back to that. Method is indicated with the letter M. Uh, the pseudo random keys are in turn used uh, together with the transcript hashes from the message uh, in the HKDF expand to produce the encryption of MAC keys and also the uh, exporter API. And some of these MACs are signed, as we mentioned previously. So just for example, we take method zero, which is the sig sig. Uh, both have signatures. Uh, in that case, there are no ephemeral static uh, keys. So the input from the left is omitted and the, um, the pseudo random keys are all the same. Um, and then uh, it's only differing in the transcript hashes. In this case, the max are being signed. Or uh, as another example, we take the method three, which is the static Diffie-Hellman Diffie case when um, both the ephemeral uh, static uh, shared secrets are involved and there the PRKs are all different. And in this case, there the max are not signed. Next slide, please. And the final point on the uh, in, in in final field in, in the protocol is the auxiliary data, so AD one, two, and three. And these are intended as integration points for ad hoc in in lightweight security applications. And so, for example, using this in third party authorization or, or enrolling a device certificate together with with the authentication. So there is this is an optimization. Uh, so this particular example here is showing the third party authorization optimization. So instead of first running an authentication protocol, uh, this is a device now joining a network, uh, a device on the, on the left hand side, uh, a domain authenticator in the middle, and they are running ad hoc. And then there's a third party authorization server on, on the right. So instead of first running the, the authentication protocol and then later run, run a protocol where you find out whether you actually uh, are authorized to connect to this, uh, this network or not, um, this procedure is doing 
the authorization embedded into the authentication protocol. So the uh, auxiliary data is used for authorization information and provides uh, information such that uh, after the authentication protocol, there has been mutual authentication and also mutual authorization. So more, more details are provided in this uh, draft here. Okay, next slide. Um, yes, so we're done with the, going through the protocol fields. Uh, there are two slides more in this part. Uh, one is about, uh, this one is about how to transport ad hoc in co-op and, and how the use of OSCORE. Ad hoc may be a very straightforward map to co-op, you know, just using uh, posts and, and the response code like 204. And in, um, in, the initiator may either be a co-op client like in the picture on the right hand side or it may be a co-op server which is uh, not discussed in this slide uh, so this is uh, a one and a half round trip for, for the protocol uh, if you want to use oscore you could either complete the two round trips and then uh, start the oscore request response uh, over co-op or you could uh, include the oscore request response in the second round trip, as is discussed in this draft referenced here, uh, which is proposed for core. And uh, that basically gives you the ad hoc uh, authenticated key exchange and OSCORE, first OSCORE request response in two round trips. Uh, and the last bullet just shows how you get the OSCORE security, con security context out of the ad hoc protocol uh, so OSCORE needs uh, a master secret and two identifiers, uh, and they are provided as, as described here. And the algorithms for OSCORE was negotiated, so you just pick the selected cipher suite. Okay. Uh, so there's a comment from John here on the on the on the, the x coordinate of g the x. And, yes, that's right. So that that that's a good point. That uh, you don't need to send. Question. Oh. Oh, I, I, sorry, I, I missed a lot of in the chat. Uh, <laughs> I'll get back to that. Sorry, go on to the next slide. Uh, this is the final slide here. Um, and then you can take questions. So there is, a, a, as was uh, announced in, in the responses to the adoption call, a lot of people are working on implementations. And, and that's, uh, I just mentioned a few here. Uh, Martin Dish has made a Rust implementation, which is uh, openly available. Uh, it's part of his OSCORE implementation. Stefan Ristisov uh, has made a, uh, he, has, he actually implemented all uh, methods uh, in, in microcontrollers and also uh, some um, different implementations using uh, ARM Trust Zone. And it has made some performance measurements on that, which he's uh, working on publishing. And also his code uh, is planned to be open source, but I uh, yeah, we have to ask Stefan what status on that. Uh, University of Mercia, Mercia have been doing uh, uh, ad hoc implementations for a long time. And the current contact point is, is uh, Eduardo Ingles. There is also C++ programming, uh, program in, in, in the old ad hoc repo for generating test vectors. Uh, so that, that concludes the uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, so if somebody has a question, then just jump to the line. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to check on the status of the additional data, because uh, I think we've gone sort of back and forth between a couple different things uh, for the message two. And if I remember correctly from the slide, it was showing up within the blue box that was supposed to be in the XOR encryption. Um, and could you just confirm that the, the additional data is covered under the encryption and if it's also covered under the MAC or signature? Uh, let's see now. The, the uh, uh, additional data is also included in the external IAD, I think. I need to look at that. Uh, I don't know. I don't off the top of my head. 
Okay. So oh, I, I could, can ask. That's a good list, point. Yes. So, yeah. So your concern was whether you could actually make changes, or, or what's what's the concern? Uh, I was just trying to make sure I remembered what we ended up with because I think we had talked about more than one variant over time, and I had forgotten which one we decided to use, at least for now. Right. So, so uh, yeah, I, I I don't have the draft in front of me. I need to look it up. Okay. But yeah, basically, I, I'll just ask on the list. Right. But basically, um, the the intent here is the security guarantees provided for the additional uh, for the auxiliary data is that we have actually no guarantees for for AD1 and for AD2 we we don't know it's we cannot say it's confidential because it depends on I mean you, you don't know who starts this protocol or who is involved before you actually get to message 3 so AD3 could be encrypted and and integrity protected but AD2 doesn't really have any uh, at least no confidentiality guarantees i have to look up the integrity okay thanks so just to get onto that the, the, i don't know that particular example that particular example uh, in the draft uh, with the auxiliary data and the third party authorization in that case the auxiliary data is basically a a mac so it's a, a truncated mac 8 bytes truncated mac that's the content uh, in that example Okay, do we have any other questions? Yeah. So, Daniel? Uh, yeah, this is Daniel Kangelo. Uh, ben, I think the answer to your question about whether the AD um, is included is that there's a transcript. Can you go to the next slide here? Uh, one more. No, I, I don't know how to tell you which slide to go to. Uh, sorry. Next, probably. Yeah, there is a transcript hash. Um, there you go. Yeah, that one, the, the, the flow chart there. The TH2 should include the hash of me the messages, which should include the, um, uh, the additional data, if that makes sense. That's right. That's correct. OK, right. Can I, you verify that you both get the same thing by putting it in the key schedule, but at the time, you don't necessarily know who sent it. And it may, and you can't send, like, fully, you can't send data in it that you don't want to be public uh, because you haven't authenticated the other party yet. Or AD1. And maybe eighty-two, but eighty-three to be safe. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, so uh, we have another question. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So we. If, if I could ask people to please say your name before you ask a question, just for the audio record, I guess it's easier. Thanks, so Mohit. Mohit, you want to go ahead or? Yeah, go ahead, Mohit. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, could you go back a few slides where there's this explanation on uh, this method or, or like what happens? Uh, the, the initiator is uh, suggesting. Like I'm, I'm trying to understand: Is there any requirement on the initiator to know what kind of authentication it expects from the responder, especially if it has RPK, PSK certificates? Uh, like, uh, could you explain that part again? I wasn't uh, I, I, sure. Like, if I understand what happens if there are multiple credentials, and does the initiator need to know? or indicate what it expects from the responder yeah currently there is no no negotiation or or information sharing on methods here so this this assumes that the initiator knows whether the responder is going to use a signature or a static diffie monkey that's basically what it needs to know 
And, and uh, there is an option if we want, and that's that we provide use the same type of uh, error flow as for Cypher suites to provide further information about methods. But that's not currently included. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, that's that's something for you to consider if it's uh, worth adding. Uh, and also, also the case where maybe the initiator has uh, several credentials, especially if I think of uh, group scenarios where, in some cases, you might want to like identify that someone is a member of the group or then individually identify that initiator uh, then you might want to like have some kind of error flow for con cases where like you can tell the initiator that uh, maybe psk is not good enough and you need to use uh, certificate based authentication for example yeah so, so the current uh, just to clarify the current uh uh, assumption is that we are only using uh, asymmetric protocol here. So, so PSK-based authentication is out of scope uh, for, for for the initial scope. Uh, but it, it is the option between signature and, and, and static Diffie-Hellman that's currently uh, unknown to the initiator. When it comes to identification, uh, exactly how to get the um, the credential, that's that's provided in the ID cred R. So that that should be the um, so either, either the raw public key itself or, or an identifier to something that you could fetch the uh, public key. But currently, there, there is only the case either a signature or static uh, Diffie-Hellman. So I don't I don't know if the what what the group setting would be, uh, if I understand you right, would be that you actually have you have multiple and you want the uh, responder to choose or or why why. Would you, could you give an example when you need to provide to open up for for multiple? I, I, I guess if you don't support PSK, then it doesn't really uh, make a difference. But in in case there was this PSK, then it might be the case that for certain operations, you just want to verify that the node is a member of the group, and maybe like the PSK that is configured for the group is fine, but for some other operations, you want to identify the device and uh, individually and want to use certificates. OK, but, sorry. So, yeah, so yeah. you were thinking of, yeah, more like group type. That's explicitly excluded from the requirements, actually, group type. This is strictly peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So right. I don't think that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's fine. Just clarifying since, since we have time on the agenda. Great. Uh, Thank you. Also, maybe another question was about uh, you mentioned that the device or the initiator can uh, use a to one AR certificate yeah. as uh, as authentication credentials. And then you also mentioned later on in this that uh, you can uh, like combine the enrollment in this auxiliary data. So I'm wondering like. Is the goal that you start with a certificate and then get another certificate or like enroll another certificate or? Yes, that's one one scenario uh, that you start with, say, the manufacturer uh, built in uh, a credential. So you in the factory, you provision a, uh, a um, I think it's called IDEV uh, ID, which is uh, the signed by the manufacturer and then when this device is being provisioned and being uh, commissioned, being deployed in, in a network, then you want to enroll a an operator or a, net, sort of a network operator certificate. So then you you would authenticate with one certificate, and you would, for the purpose of enrolling a second certificate. And just just to add to that, um, in neither of those certificates need to be transported over the constrained link. So you could both, in the case when you authenticate, you could provide a reference. And the result of the enrollment could also be a reference going back to, to the device. So the only thing you have is your pilot, your public key, of course. You need to have your key pair on the device. But the certificates stay out of the constraint things. And that's the type of scenario where you want to, 
uh, where you may want to uh, use the auxiliary data to integrate enrollment with authentication. Okay. Is that? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we have one more question from Ben, I guess. I yeah, just to follow up on, on the latest bit. So when you're using a reference to the certificate, uh, would that be possible for the device to never actually have to dereference the reference to its own certificate? It just sort of get back so it gets back a URI and it knows that that URI corresponds to its own certificate. Uh, but when it goes to talk to other things, it can just always send that URI and it doesn't ever need to retrieve its own certificate. In principle, yes, uh, that, okay. that that's been. Uh, I mean, I this has this is not this is not specified yet, but these are sort yeah, of yeah. It's just a, a wild and crazy thought that occurred to me right. as the previous question was going on. Yes, that, exactly. Okay. That is, is the intent. Yes, thanks. Okay, so sh I guess we should. We are a bit over time, so uh, I guess we should conclude now. Stephen, what do you think? Uh, One more in the queue. Uh, there's one more in the queue. Yes. Okay. Let's take that one. And yeah, but we have another presentation on issues, so uh, we'll be encouraging people to open issues and GitHub. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Sir, yes, we sure. hear you. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question. I uh, think regarding the previous one, what Mo Mohit asked, uh, and um, it, it's a it's a purely a deployment scenario. Uh, so I understand that uh, you know it could be a manufacturer signed 802.1 AR certificate, but you know many practical scenarios. Right? Say for example, I buy a device, then I activate that after one year, and if that certificate is invalid, uh, is that that uh, in the protocol there is any way before the you know operator certificate is assigned? There is any way to actually verify or bootstrap that device? So the the revocation um, of credentials used in the protocol is um, is not excluded from the requirements, but it's we are we are only going to look at certain simple cases for for verifying validity of credentials. Uh, that's in the, at least in the initial scope, and. Uh, I, I don't know exactly. I don't have an answer to to your question. Uh, how how this will handle it specifically, um, but I can imagine that you could have that type of some sort of revocation related information. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard question. What what happens to the device if 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 the the only credential, assuming this is the only credential it's using and and it's expired, then of course that that's a problem for for using that device in general yeah so i don't really know how you would solve that in this protocol yeah so yeah I, I understand i think it's possibly i was just curious right because i think that it's not that it may not be expired right but you know that there are lots of lots of you know companies they produce the device manufacturer and then companies sold and you know <laughs> there could be a lot of other things right so from a consumer perspective right you know whether there will be a way to actually bootstrap that device. So that's, uh, and I understand that these are the scenarios difficult to, you know, um, uh, cover all the scenarios, but uh, um, it just, uh, you know, uh, I'm curious that whether you thought about that. Um, no, I don't have any, I mean, I don't have anything more than, than, uh, than I said yes now. So, sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we we'll take one more Chen Meling. I think you're up now, so go ahead. Hello. Hey, I'm wondering whether the general public will be used for signature or encryption. What the raw public is used for? Yes. Yes. Used so, for. It's, it, so it's. Uh, it's used um, if, if it's a raw, if the raw, the raw public key may either be a public signature key, in which it's used for signing, uh, or it's used uh, is it's a static Diffie-Hellman key, in which case it's used to generate uh, the shared secret, uh, which is used in the key scheme, uh, the, this um, colorful picture uh, key hierarchy, and 
and to create the keys, uh, derive the keys used for encryption on Mac. So that's uh, that's where the, uh, the raw public key goes. Did that answer your question? Yes, I got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so let's conclude then and go to the next item in the agenda, which is uh, the open issues of the ad hoc draft. So I will switch the slides. Joran, you are again the presenter. Yes, sorry about that. No, it's, yeah, so we have to get over time. No worries. Yeah. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, so, yes, we have uh, started to compile open issues. Uh, we are using the Lake repo, the Lake Working Group uh, GitHub repository, uh, which you see the link here. And the, currently, it's only three uh, issues based on the comments uh, we've got uh, so far. And uh, yeah, and then there's at the end, there's some next steps also. But let's go for the, the three open issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the first, yeah, was a straightforward comment by Martin Dish. Uh, he thought that reading COSI was, he didn't want to read too much of COSI to implement ad hoc. And uh, we have already a um, subsection in Appendix A speaking about COSI, and we can definitely expand that on, on COSI sign and COSI encrypt without duplicating the specification. So yes, we should do that. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a comment by René Struik, uh, why we are enforcing both SHA-512 and SHA-256. So the setting is this, that the Cypher suite 0 and 1 includes ED25519, which specifies SHA-512. But we also, as explicitly the hash functions used, we also require SHA-256, because that's that's typically what you would use with, uh, with, uh, with this uh, setup. So the question, so we were, we we're actually mandating both. And the question is, what should we do about that? And I think some, some people can uh, uh, wit bear witness about the problems related to that. And uh, that would be great if people could, could comment and provide input. Um, but the options I see is basically either we, we don't change, we require both, or we change the hash algorithm to five, SHA-512 but in practice, I, I suppose that the limitations come from uh, that hardware support already provides SHA-2556. So just changing here the, um, would, would make this would make it look like a um, less of a requirement, but you still it doesn't really solve the problem. And then uh, there has been discussions about uh, ED25519 with SHA-256. And I'm not really up to date with all uh, with what's the latest date there, uh, but just strictly, strictly speaking from an IoT point of view, I mean, this type of implementation in constrained device, uh, if you want uh, the Edwards curves to be deployed, uh, then having a specification with SHA-256 instead of SHA-512 would ease the implementation, I think. So maybe someone can add add to this. Uh, I think, Malisha, you had some, some ideas on, on hardware. Uh, yes, so most of the chair head off, uh, this is Malisha speaking. So most of the hardware I've seen implements SHA-256. And I think it's from the implementation point of view, it's important that we converge on a single algorithm uh, to use. Uh, so either option, uh, two or option three, I think seems the most feasible, but for option three, I'm not familiar with the current state of the development of the documents. So maybe someone could chime in there, but essentially the bottom line is I would like to see a single algorithm uh, that we converge on a single algorithm, hash algorithm to use. So are you in, in the queue to talk on this point or just still in the queue? Oh, sorry, Stephen, did you ask me? Uh, I asked Subar, yes, I, I, I don't know who spoke there. Yes, yes, I, I did speak earlier, so thanks. Okay, so I can kick you out of the queue. Okay, fair enough. Um, 
Okay, so I guess re re resolving this issue, or it probably needs some some discussion on the mailing list, and maybe checking with the uh, CF4G, particularly if option three was with desires. Mohit, Mohit, you're up. Yeah, uh, I was just also writing in in the Java chat. So this is something we encountered a while back uh, in six low, and uh, thanks to Rene, uh, I think we have. Of this issue, so I, I put put a link to a couple of drafts on on how we have done it in in six low working groups. So basically, uh, we use a different representation convention for the same curve. So the curve is still two five five one nine, but instead of the Edwards uh, compressed, if you use the weight truss, then you can use uh, SHA two fifty six. Okay, that certainly sounds like something to run past CFRG at some point. In, indeed, so that that's the plan for the Elvig draft, which Rene has written. I mean, it has already undergone uh, last call, seg D reviews, and so on. But we agreed with the AD uh, that uh, when the IETF last call is issued, uh, CFRG would would also be informed of this. And, and, and this, this is something, uh, again, I'm not familiar with all the NIST specifications, but Rene seems to follow them. So this is something also in the latest NIST 800 something something. I can't remember the exact document number. Sure. But I mean, I, I think people should be aware that there's, there's probably a non zero probability that, that redefining 25519 with chat 256 is something that does not. Turn out to be a good idea. So I wouldn't. The fact that something is an IDF last call that assumes that does not necessarily mean it will actually happen. I think that, that that's something to be aware of, and uh, the discussion with CFRG would need to happen. Sure. Yeah. Uh, makes sense. Okay. Thanks for the input, Mohit. Could you please put your references in the in the issue? Would that be possible? It's a lake uh, working group GitHub issue. Sure. No, we'll, yeah. Okay. So let's write down in the minutes in the, the action point for this to comment on the issues for my hit uh, to put the documents in the comment section. Or, or anyone that has input here, please provide yes. your input. Sure. Yes. And let's continue this discussion on the mailing list then. Yes. Okay. Next if slide. There are no other. Uh, if there are no oh. other comments, I suppose uh, I see none. Right. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, right. So this is uh, a slide with too much text. Unfortunately, it, it probably com complicates the issue more than it solves. But we have uh, an agreement uh, in the requirements uh, that we should not uh, include. PSK, ECDHE in the initial scope. Uh, this is currently in the draft, but we need to take it out. Uh, so we need to replace that. And um, I think we need to first discuss a little bit more what we need to replace it with. Um, and that's uh, the actions there. Um, we need to take a step back and think about what are the practical attacks on IoT settings that we need to handle uh, with, with, for example, with some symmetric key scheme. Uh, we had a discussion initially, that's a mail thread reference, uh, which looked at how to provide uh, forward secrecy uh, without Diffie-Hellman. It was a PSK, uh, a symmetric key-based scheme. But that was just a starting point, uh, and it didn't really look at, at the problem. It looked more like a, this is, a, this is a, a lightweight solution. So I think we need to retract this and get back to the actual problem statement. Um, but in this context, there are a lot of things to think about. For example, protection of long-term keys compared to session keys and, and passive or active attack, for example. And there's also uh, some interesting ideas coming out of this, of this thread I, I mentioned above, uh, like for example, doing uh, key rotation within the session so that you don't need to take down uh, a session to, to uh, change keys because you could do it if, you, if it's based on sequence numbers and we in OSCOR, for example we already have sequence numbers 
then client and server knows when to change change keys. So I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm making this very clear now, but I think we need, basically we need to restart, we need to take out the PSK ECDHE, that's clear from the requirements, and exactly what we're gonna replace it with needs further discussion. Um, so and I'll, I'll start that thread again on the email list. And that was the last issue, next slide please. So next steps, uh, submitting a new version without PSK ESDHE. Uh, I plan to do that on my plane home. And then uh, we have today, which we should talk about now, the, the Tamarin verification and all the considerations from that, which we need to take care of. Uh, there is also an uh, old repo uh, with issues. We need to go through that and see what are relevant still. Uh, not only listing issues, we need to fix issues too. And uh, we are welcoming more reviews. And at some point we should um, should plan the plug test between implementations. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Joran. So uh, I guess, so let's write down in the minutes that the action point for you is to uh, start the discussion on the uh, on this issue, issue number three. Yes. Yeah. So I just missed mentioning that. And then with that, uh, we are open to take any questions you might have. Do we have anyone in the queue? No, not at present. Uh, but I would encourage people to open issues. If you're opening an issue on GitHub, um, you know, if it's, an, if it's an editorial or a niche or something, then just doing it on GitHub is fine. But if it's a substantive issue, please also send a mail to the list. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll have to watch where the discussion happens on GitHub or, and or on the mailing list. Uh, but I would encourage people to use the issue tracker and, and, on GitHub and create issues there and then start related list discussion for non-trivial ones. Does, does any has anybody who's read the draft got any other issues that they might want to not formally raise now but bring up in, in audio at the moment? It's a good time if you have. And again, we don't I don't see anybody in the queue, so we'll probably move ahead to the next one. There's a, there should be time for AOB at the end if you if you're having to read the draft now and come back to some issue at the end of uh, the next presentation. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, and I guess we'll hear more about the second point here on issues based on the Tamarin model uh, by Carl yeah. in a little bit. Yeah. So with that, let's conclude that uh, agenda item and let's skip to the last uh, slot before I uh, before any other business, uh, which is the formal analysis of ad hoc by Carl. Uh, Carl, uh, can, uh, do you hear us? Yeah, and we, we see you. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we hear you. And uh, just say next slide when you want me to flip, please. Oh, yes, thanks. Uh, okay, so this is a uh, sort of progress report on the formal analysis of uh, ad hoc that we have been working on. Uh, and we fixed the version from 1st of March. Uh, so there will be some uh, discrepancies compared to what uh, Joran just talked about, but we uh, get to that. Uh, and if you are interested in reading sort of the uh, current version of, of the report, you have the link here on this page. Okay, next please. Uh, so this is joint work uh, between me and Vaishnavi and Alessandro, and it's uh, partially sponsored by the WASP uh, program. Uh, next please. Uh, so, uh, first I give a quick overview of, of form analysis and the Tamarind tool, just in case there is someone who is not sort of uh, in, into that. Uh, and then I give a quick overview of, of the ad hoc framework as, as we view it and what we have analyzed. Uh, and then I will go into uh, the analysis itself, uh, give an overview, uh, and then uh, I will dig into two technical details, which I think might be the most interesting uh, technical aspects that, that we found. Uh, next, please. So, uh, formal analysis, uh, roughly what it is, is that, that you model protocol in some logical mathematical, mathematical formalism, and then you encode the uh, requirements and the goals that, that you want to uh, uh, sort of learn about this protocol. 
in, in some logic, and then you try to prove them uh, for, for that model. And uh, preferably you do it with some tool that can help uh, uh, checking your thinking so that you don't make uh, mistakes. Um, and uh, this is uh, a useful process <laughs> to do, uh, at least I believe. Uh, because the modeling itself and, and uh, the sort of proving the work you do reveal a lot of hidden assumptions and inconsistencies and incomplete requirements and vulnerabilities and so on as you move along. The, the proof that you end up in the end with is maybe not so interesting in itself, but the sort of process will, will reveal a lot of interesting stuff along the way. Um, and it forces you to, to really consider what, what type of attacker are, are you trying to protect against. And it also just, uh, again, specifying things, uh, clarify what, what you're talking about when you write sort of protocol specifications in pros, it's, it's very sort of easy to, to imagine that, that you have the same understanding within the group but about how, how it works, but, but actually you might have different ideas and then the more precise you can be, the better, of course. Uh, what it does not do, uh, and this is that it, it will never be sort of a proof that the protocol is secure. Um, because it's not even clear what is secure means. So, so what, what it does is that it sort of splits things up in smaller properties and shows that some a certain property hold in, in that model. Uh, but also it is a need to understand that there's a huge difference between the model and the actual protocol. Uh, the model might have missed stuff that, that, uh, that the protocol is not uh, is, is doing. It might have sort of uh, missed the attacker capabilities that, that you later find uh, interesting to cover. Uh, you might have missed properties you want to show, or uh, while you're doing the modeling, you might abstract away uh, details of the protocol that are, are actually important. So, so that means that you cannot just get the sort of stamp saying is secure when you're done, but you get more detailed knowledge and, and a higher assurance level of the protocol. Uh, next, please. Uh, so the Tamarind tool itself, uh, this is a very super simplified uh, view of what it does, but, but essentially uh, you define the the, uh, the protocol as a kind of uh, description of the, the roles, the initiator and responder, and then you sort of uh, describe what the attacker can do. And you put that into some uh, into model definition, which is a kind of a parallel function program, if you like. And from that, uh, uh, Tamarin will, will generate uh, conceptually all possible executions of, of these agents in, and attackers. Uh, and, and then you, you define the properties in, in LTL style logic and, and you sort of very, uh, Tamarin will help you prove that uh, the, whether these properties hold over all traces or not, or whether there exists a certain trace with some property that you're interested in. Um, so that's on, on a very high level of what is going on conceptually. Uh, next, please. So the adopt framework, uh, so it essentially, uh, there are many ways, different ways to look at it, but essentially I, I think we can view it as, as a sort of, it follows the noise framework, uh, with the addition that uh, you now also have the possibility to use signatures for uh, authentication, uh, which is not yet supported in the noise framework, as at least not the, the version I, I found on the noise uh, homepage. Uh, and this means that we, we get, when both parties use signatures, for instance, we get into a Sigma style protocol, uh, and it's very, very close to, to, to Sigma I, but not exactly the same. Um, and then, of course, also ad hoc adds uh, these encodings like Cosine, Seaborn, all those kind of things, but, but we have not modeled that level of detail in, in Tamarin. Uh, ad hoc also reuses this uh, challenge response signature uh, sort of way of working for, for the stat methods. Uh, and the stat methods are just the, this static diff Hellman key things that Jorvan talked about earlier. Uh, and it uses this transcript hash way, way of working like TLS has uh, and uses G to the XY as the uh, session key material essentially. Um, not really, because ad hoc sort of outputs a, a state which the HKDF can uh, uh, then use to extract session keys from. But, but what, what gives sort of the secrecy and, and the authentication properties of is this D to the XY or D to the IY or D to the RX if you're using the uh, uh, stat based methods. And the stat based methods looks uh, like OPTLS, and we'll see more about that later on. Um, and uh, so far, it's a bit unclear whether it's an exact 
mapping to noise extended with, with uh, uh, signatures. Uh, it, it's a bit uh, sort of both the noise specification and the uh, error specification are, are very prose like, so it's difficult to see exactly whether the correct parameters goes um, where, where they should. Uh, luckily, there's this noise explorer uh, work which is uh, formalizing the, the noise protocol more, and I, th I think it would be easy probably to to try to map against uh, that, that formal specification to see whether uh, the mapping is exact, so to speak. Um, but, but all in all, that the sort of cryptographic course that Adoc uses is, is uh, well understood constructions. Uh, and and if, if we sort of look at what are the sort of main methods that would be of interest, uh, I believe what, what there might be some subtleties is with this stat sig and sig stat methods, and, and that is where one part is using uh, static if Elman key and the other part is using a signature because this is kind of a mix of, of, uh, of, of existing things. Uh, all in all, we have modeled all, all, all the methods anyway just to be on the safe side. Uh, next, please. So, if we uh, simplify the ad hoc framework enormously, uh, we end up with something like this. Uh, essentially, we have the initiator and responder, and in the message number one, the initiator sends uh, G to the X to the responder, and uh, the responder uses its uh, credential, cred R, the green, uh, to uh, uh, authenticate itself towards the initiator. And it also includes G to the I, uh, G to the Y, sorry, uh, for, uh, to, to generate the, the session key. And then the session key is some KDF for, of the G to the XY, and possibly something more. And then, a heads up here is that, that I have simplified things, so you shouldn't really read these as functions, but more like uh, the session key depends on G to the XY, even though it says KF. So, so it's more like dependencies that are of interest on, on this abstraction level. Uh, next, please. So one could, uh, and you can take the next also maybe at the same time. Um, so, so one could view it as uh, the first uh, flight, uh, M1 and M2, uh, is sort of the authentication of the responder towards the initiator. But then you can also imagine that message number two is the first uh, message of a second round where it's, uh, the purpose is to, uh, to authenticate the initiator towards the responder using the blue uh, credi credential. So, so in, in a sense, that middle message is sort of serving both as the last message of one protocol and the first message of the second protocol. Uh, which is also kind of following that the noise way, way of thinking. Um, and, and the only difference in, in what sort of is the key session key material or what sort of we will uh, contribute to the secrecy of the session key material is that in the stat based method, with one of the parts is using the static if Hellman key, then, then the session key will also depend on uh, the credential of that, that uh, party. And, and again, if we uh, think about uh, OPTLS, it would essentially be, since OPTLS does have mutual authentication, uh, it would be that the uh, uh, responder's uh, uh, static key would be included into the uh, sort of secrecy components of the session key. Uh, but, but for all other methods, it's just G to the XY, that's the session key material. Uh, next, please. So, uh, this is kind of a overview of what we have looked at. So we have modeled all five methods and the fifth method here, which is in addition to what uh, Jan mentioned, is the PSK method, which we also modeled. And that was present in the March version of the draft we were looking at. And we have proved like the basic uh, fundamental properties, authentication, PFS, session key independence, and so on. Uh, and we are planning to start looking into uh, weak PCS, uh, so that's weak post-compromise security, and that means essentially that the adversary has temporary access to uh, uh, to, to using the long-term credential. For instance, you have access to a SIM card or a TPM, but it doesn't actually read the long-term credential. And the attacker is, of course, able to attack all session keys generated from that as long as he has access to the TPM. But when the, the, that access is revoked, uh, then uh, future session keys are, are still secure. So that's the weak, uh, weak version, and I am pretty sure that holds. The uh, strong PCS will, of course, not hold. Uh, and the next thing we're planning to look into is uh, KCI resistance. I'm pretty sure that also holds because it's based on, on sort of ad hoc is based on, on known 
constructions, but not I wouldn't bet as uh, much on that one as the big pieces until we have actually checked it. Um, we also, during this work, we identified some, some missing considerations in, in the draft. Uh, for instance, non-repudiation aspects and, and uh, so sort of whether you should think about TEs and, and session key reveal queries and stuff like that. Uh, we also run into one, one uh, the unintended authentication confusion, which is sort of a, not so much a problem with, with ad hoc, but, but it's sort of an un, un, uh, not sufficiently explored uh, um, relation between ad hoc and, and its application that's using ad hoc. So, so that API kind of needs to be a bit more looked into, we believe. Um, and then also, what, what is the actual, what should constitute a session key? The definition of that is also something that we believe should be investigated more, and I'll come back to that. Uh, so the general conclusion is that that builds on, on well-established components, and it seems to behave as, as one could expect. Uh, also, all these different methods, though, have, have quite different uh, security guarantees. Uh, so, so, so depending on which credential you choose, you will get sort of a different properties of the protocol. And, and one could uh, sort of uh, perhaps wish that that would be some, some baseline that all method has these sort of basic properties. And, and then you might get something in addition where one use others and so on. Uh, but then we need to define exactly what would that, that base set of properties be. Um, and this comes, I, I believe, from the, the fact that ad hoc is sort of established based on, on it, it should establish an OSCOR security context, uh, but it, it sort of is, it's, uh, does that and see how, how good can you make that given some restrictions. But, but then, then the actual use of the protocol is less well explored, which means that um, it's not so clear exactly which properties are the most ones that are important to, to, to verify or check. Uh, and then we believe that if you're looking into like user stores or use cases or something, try, try to, to sort of extract what would be the most common and most important properties that that would sort of gu guide both the design of the protocol and, and uh, sort of what, what the verification work should, should focus on. Uh, next, please. So uh, before digging into to this, um, uh, Session key authentication property, which we think was perhaps the most interesting finding, uh, uh, just brief overview of the attacker model that, that we have considered. So, so we considered like a, a standard dual of Yao uh, attacker model, so the attacker can read all messages that are sent, uh, uh, compo uh, deconstruct them into their components, compose that into new messages and insert that, and can delete messages and do all those kind of things, and can run an unlimited number of sessions. Uh, and it also means then that the uh, uh, we make sort of a perfect cryptography assumption that that an encryption algorithm, for instance, is not possible to reverse unless you actually know the key. So if you look at message number two, for instance, uh, this encryption operation would mean that the attacker would not be able to get hold of cred R unless he actually has the key used to encrypt that. Um, so yeah, that, that, uh, next please. Um, that's I guess a well-known thing. Uh, and the attacker also has the possibility to uh, compromise parties. Uh, after, and this is to model uh, perfect forward secrecy, so after the session is complete, uh, complete uh, the attacker can, can compromise the long-term key. Uh, and the, there's a mistake in the slide that says that it also can complete, uh, compromise the session state, but uh, we don't have session state reveal queries, but we do have uh, session key reveal queries. That's also to be able to model uh, PFS uh, and secrecy actually, just basic. Um, we are working in the pre-specified peer model, and that means that both parties know uh, prior to running the protocol uh, who they're going to talk to. That's a fairly standard uh, simplification. Uh, we also uh, assume that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the identity of uh, a party and its uh, public key or its uh, uh, and its private key. So that means that the attacker cannot register uh, a new. Uh, public key for a, um, a, a given identity uh, that already, already exists. And this is in line with what the ad hoc assumption uh, is assuming itself in, in the uh, draft. And it also simplifies things. Uh, we are using a, a symbolic uh, derivability based notion of secrecy. 
So you're not looking at any type of uh, observation equivalence or, or uh, distinguishability-based security notions. So basically, can the secrecy it depends on whether the attacker can actually derive a certain term in the underlying term algebra, rather than trying to see what he can differentiate between different things. Um, and uh, we also use uh, Gavin Low style authentication uh, based on corresponding uh, correspondence properties so over the traces. Um, and we assume that all non-compromised parties are honest and, and don't try to, to uh, that they do as, as the protocol prescribes. They don't try to cheat each other, each other or do other strange things to themselves. Uh, next, please. So, <clears throat> if we then look at uh, uh, what we, uh, which version of session key uh, authentication we use, uh, so, so we went for, for the uh, something called injected agreement, and here it's uh, going to be described in, in the uh, SIG SIG um, method. So, it means that the initiator and responder using uh, standard signatures to authenticate themselves to each other. Uh, and in this case, uh, if you take next, please, we can see that. Um, uh, what, what that means is that if the initiator receives message number two, uh, uh, that then he can derive the session key as uh, some function of, of g to the xy. Uh, but he, if that happens, he also knows that at some point in time uh, during this protocol run, uh, the responder also is able to derive g to the xy. And there's exactly one uh, instance of that event that the responder uh, derives g to the xy. So it means that both parties, are, uh, they agree on, on which key they have uh, derived, key to the xy, uh, but, they, uh, but the initiator also knows that uh, there is exactly one uh, instance of, of the responder running that runs. So it, it cannot be the case the attacker has fooled uh, the responder, for instance, into to running, uh, believing that it has run two sessions or three sessions. There is not, not, not the case that the attacker fooled the responder into believing that uh, the session key is g to the x z for some z, for instance. So, so this is the uh, injected agreement thing. And, and of course, you can uh, prove this also for, for other part, not only the session key, but for, for like for <coughs> algorithm choices and uh, the AD and uh, 81 and 82 and so on. Uh, not 81, but for, for 82 um, and so on. But, but we have not modeled that yet to, to some um, problems with uh, getting Tamarind to, to terminate. Uh, and then this, uh, this property then, then of course holds in the other direction as well. So the responder, when, and if you look at the blow flow, when the responder authenticates the initiator, what, what would happen is that when, when the responder gets uh, the third message, it would know that there is a corresponding event on the initiator side, <coughs> which is unique, uh, which also has sort of made the initiator uh, derived, derived, derived the key to the XY. And, and this then holds for four methods, except for, for the case where the initiator uses the stat method for authentication, um, and uh, this, uh, if you take the next slide, uh, I will explain why this is um, is the case. And the reason is that uh, the session key material is defined as g to the xy and g to the iy. So basically, there is a dependent. The key material, session key material, depends on the. Uh, uh, secret key of the initiator. And because the, uh, we have this um, uh, identity hiding or identity protection, uh, it means that the responder doesn't know who it's talking to when it's sending message number two. And that means that it does not, cannot possibly compute anything that depends on, on uh, the initiator's uh, either private or public key in any way. Uh, so, so that means that there is no guarantee for the initiator that the uh, responder actually knew key to the Y, and, and in fact, if it did, it would be a problem for identity protection. So, so we, we cannot get uh, injected agreement on, on this key material. Um, so uh, next, please. Um, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, then next. So, so that we don't have that. Uh, but so what we proved instead is that uh, we, you can have an uh, implicit key authentication and that means basically that if the initiator sends message number three, it knows that if the responder receives message number three, it's only the responder that can compute the session key and no one else can do it. Uh, and what this gives us is essentially that, that the key key is, uh, we, the key will receive it, but there is no confirmation from the initiator that the responder actually has computed this key. 
which would be the case in the injective agreement property. And whether that is needed or not is, um, depends on what the protocol is going to be used for. Uh, next, please. So we have uh, come up with four uh, alternatives how to fix this, and there is probably more if, if you put your mind to it. Uh, uh, one would be to sort of uh, accept this fact, so, so you do include the, uh, uh, the dependencies on, on uh, uh, the initiator's uh, private key, um, and then you would accept that you have different authentication properties for, for the different methods. That feels a bit unsatisfying because I think that's a kind of a fundamental thing. If, in, if you need key confirmation, that, 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 that should not really depend on which credential you use. That, that feels a bit unsettling. Um, two, on the other hand, uh, say, okay, let's exclude that, uh, that dependency and just run G to the XY also in this case. Uh, but then that is different, uh, differing from, from what OpTLS is doing. And uh, if you look at uh, the design of TLS, it's really carefully designed for for, um, for, for the CK style model, where, where you have session state uh, reveal queries. And uh, I mean, it, it, it feels unnecessary to throw that property away just to get uh, to harmonize across all uh, ad hoc methods. So this one doesn't either feel very nice. Uh, the third one will be to include a fourth message from R to I, include a MAC based on a key derived from the key material, uh, but it can't be from the same branch as the actual session key because then we lose key uh, indistinguishability if one would like to prove that in some computational model later on. Um, and this, of course, is not so nice either for, for the applications because now they would need a, a fourth message, which is not preferable which leaves us with the fourth message method uh, or fourth idea would be to include the initiator's ID in message number one. Uh, and what happens then is that uh, that removes identity protection for the initiator. Uh, and that is not so nice either. Uh, but one could also consider that there is a discussion in, in the ad hoc draft that, that sort of the, the roles can be reversed. So, so if there is some entity that, that really should have identity protection, one could uh, consider reversing the roles and, and having that role, uh, so that, that entity acting as a responder instead of initiator. Uh, th there could be situations where that's a problematic also though, because it might require like an initial trigger message just to kick off the protocol. So it's not clear that that's a, a perfect solution either. Uh, which brings us to the last two bullets and the first one, which is unfortunately uh, cut a bit short, uh, says that without better understanding what the protocol goes, selecting between these alternatives is difficult. Uh, it should say, um, which I believe it is. Um, there needs to be a trade-off made somehow. Uh, and then one could also consider that if that trade-off, when it's made, should that be made, uh, be aligned across all methods, that you have the same property of all methods, if you consider this to be a very important property. So that, I think, is one thing that could be uh, discussed as an issue. Uh, and this also sort of connects to, to uh, both sort of how, how, to, which, how to select the key material, but also which kind of properties do, do, do we want to have and how, how do we harmonize between methods. Uh, and I believe that is all I have. So um, if you have any questions, I, I've seen that I've been scrolling a few questions on the chat, but I haven't been able to follow that, unfortunately. Yeah, but, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Carl. If people have questions, now is the time to jump in the queue. There's been a bunch of chat in, in Jabber, but apparently not resulting in audio questions. But I'll give it a minute. Uh, so I have a question, Carl. Uh, uh, is there a kind of a plan for how to wrap up this kind of uh, excellent kind of theory work and, and uh, proofs and so on in terms of getting published, getting peer reviewed, uh, having other teams that we know of doing the same thing? How long might it all take? Um, what, what's your kind of thought? I'm not asking for precise answers right now, but what's kind of the general plan, would you say? Uh, yeah, so we put it on, on archive, and, and of course, we are very uh, thankful if anyone has time to, re to, to review anything there. Um, and the link is on, on the first slide. 
Uh, but, but then we are planning to submit it to to uh, conference, which uh, the deadline is in August. Uh, so, so we will uh, sort of wrap this up and polish it up a bit and, and then submit it and, and uh, see what happens. And I'm not aware of anyone doing Tamarin modeling on this uh, or ProRF modeling either, actually. Okay, and then more work goes. Yeah, no, more work is always welcome. So, so okay, so it's not a you're you, you're not thinking of this taking another six months. You're thinking of this work being kind of done soonish and maybe have to be redone after the protocol is finalized or something. Is that, that roughly a plan? Uh, yeah. So I mean, one of the problems is that, that um, uh, we've been running out of memory quite a bit with Tamarin. So I'm trying to secure a, a machine with more memory, and so that it was in the current uh, sort of roadblock. Um, but, but but I'm working on that. So when that is just done, we, I think we should um, be able to prove those lost properties that, that we were uh, want to look at. Um, and then I guess it's also, it would also be interesting to start looking into computation proofs as well at some point. Great. Yeah. Okay. Do they have Tobias? Hello, Tobias from LMU. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have questions on slide 19. Um, uh, 19, not 9. So. Um, do you, like you say, if M3 reaches responder, only the responder session will be able to compute session T. Do you want to say only if M3 reaches the responder? Oh, uh, can, can we look at the slide? Uh, it sounds like very specific wording here, so I just want to make sure I get it right. Yes, that one. <clears throat> um, I'm not 100% sure if I understand what you're saying there. Um, if, so if M3 reaches the responder, only the responder will compute the session key, or do you actually want to say only if M3 reaches the responder, the responder session will be able to compute the session key? Oh, uh, it's actually uh, actually both. So, so one, one is like, a, uh, if I understand your question correctly, one, one is the, the sort of security part that, that it's only the responder that can, can compute it and no one else. So, so, so that, that is true, but it's also, of course, true that, that uh, if the message doesn't read the respond, reach the responder, the responder will not be able to, uh, to compute the, the key. So, so both of them should be true. But the initiator can compute it as well, right? Uh, so sorry, what, your, your voice is cutting up. Uh, sorry, uh, the initiator is also uh, able to compute the session key. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Thanks. Okay, any other questions uh, on this presentation? I don't see anyone you. And uh, okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, thanks for Kutzin's work. And be, I guess at some point somebody will try and translate some of these uh, issues you found into issues in GitHub, and we can process them there. So yeah, I will send the job. That'll be great. Okay, we have Thank you. Around, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Just confirming. Yes, I'm. I'm gonna. Um, go through the uh, paper and, and make issues out of the comments uh, and feedback we got there. Fantastic. Good stuff. OK, thanks, Carl. Uh, I guess we Thank move you. to the any other business part. And if somebody wants to go back and ask questions about this, that's just fine, too. If we can kick you off the video for now. Um, OK, so we're now at the any other business part of the agenda. Does anybody have other business that they would like to bring up right now? We have like 20 minutes, so lots of other business is possible. Uh, OK, uh, yes, Ben. Uh, I'll just uh, repeat my usual plug uh, that we do have this gather.town uh, sort of informal hallway environment that people could migrate to after the session and have any 
conversations that she would have had in the hallway if we were in person in Madrid. Uh, so it would be good to get a lot of people there to sort of have the, the critical mass going and you can say hi to the friends you haven't caught up with yet or, or that sort of thing. So that's it, just a plug for gather.town. Great, thanks. Uh, I did have one one piece of other business I, which I put in the chat earlier is uh, how, how have people got thoughts as to how they want to proceed from here? Virtual meetings, wait until there's enough issues in the issue tracker, do something in September. What would you people like to do? So. Yeah, you're on here. Um, yep. I think I think a virtual meeting would be great. I mean, we have seen some ideas coming out here uh, from on, on the in the chat, and I think we'll have some more um, input on after the the issues uh, are are more tracked. So um, yeah, how about mid September or late September? Would that be a good time for an, for an interim? Sorry, I didn't catch up with Sorry, there. Catch up with uh, uh, right. Right. Yeah. So, um, well, my proposal was just yes, yes, virtual interim. That was what I wanted to say. And and the date we can discuss, but September is good. Uh, not in the beginning, but in the end or in the middle. And I think Michael have some input as well on the on the Jabber. Yeah, so Michael uh, basically is also suggesting meeting in September in a virtual interim, but uh, and also said consider a hackathon online. Um, mm. So I guess. Um, so you mentioned there are multiple implementations. Is there are people able to interrupt and test with one another? Are they doing that already? Do they would organizing an event like a hackathon or something help them do that? And when? And if so, when? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there are a number of implementations which are are, uh, I suppose, almost ready for that. But I we have to check with the other implementers and see what what's going on. Um, so I don't know. At okay. least for the progressing the spec, I think we need to have uh, a virtual meeting at some point before the next ITF. Which may well be virtual also. So, <laughs> uh, OK. <laughs> We're looking at sort of the suggestion is mid to late September. I guess we can create a, some kind of poll to see what dates people have as a preference of that. I presume we're talking like a one, two hour meeting. Yeah, I, I assume that we have some some new proposals on the table based on the discussion we had today and and what's going to happen in the next uh, month, uh, or or at least I mean what will happen in the beginning of September probably first half of September. So if we have something in the ad, end of September, I think we'll have we have material to discuss, and uh, how we do with implementations is perhaps independent of that. So I think we could have a separate sec, uh, sort of a a discussion on that uh, independently. Okay, and then so if we're talking about late September, then you're going to your plan is to reissue, you know, to put out a new draft that takes out the um, the PSK ECDH um, option, and that that'll be the next short while, I guess, right? That that should happen soon. That that yeah. will happen soon. But then then we need to add something instead. And, and sure. that's uh, that's still to be discussed, and and then we have some other feed the feedbacks from from uh, uh, from Carl here and 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 his team, and uh, yeah, th we're also expecting something from the the other formal verification team, uh, which Kartik announced, but I don't know when. So that's also something that might come in here. But I think any, anyway that the timeline in September is, is reasonable for something to discuss, and, and even if we don't rely, know right now exactly what we're going to talk about. Okay, so we can have that. And, and so I guess the, the implicit in that is we're asking other participants in the working group to kind of maybe, you know, don't bother with the zero zero draft for now, but there'll be a zero one very shortly, and please read that and raise issues based on that. I think that's what we're asking, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So good. But, but when when you get that to the list, then. 
uh, we can make that ask explicitly and then maybe s encourage people to try and raise issues between now and and like a couple of weeks before the virtual interim. And we'll send a poll for that in the next one. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. OK, that's all I had. Is there? I don't see anybody else in the queue. Again, we're in the any other business section for the next uh, going, going, gone amount of time. So anybody else want to raise any issues? If not, Ben has posted the Gather Town link into the uh, Java room, and you can head off there after you've gotten a coffee or something. And so thanks, uh, Scott. Yes. Scott, you're, you're up. I can see your video. I can't hear audio. So we'd give Scott a second in case that was a. Oh, Scott has left the room. Okay, I, I think that means that we're we're done for today. Thanks to all the presenters. Um, thanks to people for all the chat and jabber, which is good. We'll send out the minutes. We'll set up a poll, and I guess we'll talk next time, sometime in sometime late in September. Misha, anything else? Or no, nothing on my side. I guess that concludes the meeting. Great. Thanks all, and see you at the next virtual effort, whatever that is, which could be this gallery time. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.